We already watched part one of this a while back, but this is every anime student explained in 23 minutes part two. Mushi Productions was founded in 1961 by ex Toei employee and legendary godfather of manga, Osamu Tezuka. They were okay. pioneers of anime and revolutionized the media. Astro as a Boy. Whole. And the reason that Mushi Pro was even made in the first place was because Tezuka didn't enjoy his time at Toei. So he basically got a bunch of anime from Toei and was. This seems to be the reoccurring theme of existing employees at a company getting fed up and starting something new. Like, yo, I'll pay you double the salary if you join me. And Easy. The rest is history. The studio adapted a ton of Tezuka's manga series, like Astro Boy, Ashida no Joe, and Dororo. The studio was so prolific that they even worked on overseas projects like the original 1969 Frosty the Snowman Christmas special. It's hard to overstate just how much Mushi Pro really was the goat in their prime, yeah. and it was because they were exclusively hiring the best of the best. Apparently, their interview process was so difficult that some of the best anime directors like Osamu Tezaki almost failed the test. In Damn. the late 60s, to early 70s, Mushi Pro. How 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 crazy was this? Best anime directors like Osamu Tezaki almost failed the test. Let's see. Uh, is there anything else? Exam and interview process is very difficult. Uh, out of a hundred participants, out of which less than ten were selected. Honestly, that's still like ten percent, which is pretty high hit rate compared to fucking <laughs> the job market right now. Uh, they had to pass it twice. There's a last minute intervention for this guy from someone else named Kisaburo. And that's pretty much it. It's a very strict process, hiring process. Now, I doubt anyone even like recognizes this production company because, you know, like all these animes, these are such old, old shows. So you guys are way too young for this. Best. In the late 60s to early 70s, Mushi Pro was beginning their downward slip into bankruptcy. This actually would cause them to create some of their more interesting adult oriented works like A Thousand and One Nights or Cleopatra, both of which I can't. Adult works, huh? Yeah, I mean, the cover picture, A Thousand and One Nights of Doing What? Huh? What, what are we doing here? Can't show much of. Like, look at this poster of Cleopatra. I see it. Yeah. Unfortunately, these attempts to pivot into the adult animation market didn't. What the fuck? Did you see that? The panther there? Just like sniffed Cleopatra? Then his tail went erect. It didn't really work, and the studio disbanded. A lot of the That's staff crazy. ended up creating other studios, like Sunrise, Madhouse, and Kyo Annie in its wake. It's hard mm. to really convey how- Wow, look at that. Look at the children that came off of this, bro. Kyo Annie, Madhouse, Sunrise, these are some huge names. So many important people were in this one animation studio, but if you want to check out some of Mushi Pro's work, I've been told Ashino Joe is really good, and if you want something completely different, check out Belladonna of Sadness. I mean, it is easily one of the most surrealist anime I've ever seen. Like, what okay. am I watching here? White Fox was founded in 2007 by former OLM staff member. What do we know about Studio White Fox? ReZero. <laughs> That's all I know about them right now, but they did Steinsky, which is kind of crazy because, you know, both shows. It's, it's just time travel stuff, right? Nako Iwasa and other employees. They are well known for adapting popular games and light novels into anime, which okay. their first work, Tears of Tiara, was. Their second ever work was Katanagatari, which to this day has some of the most out there art style I've ever seen. And then they released Steins Gate. Katanagatari, I think, is a show that... It's not like Bakemonogatari, right? But it's by the same author? Like, it's a different universe entirely. Like, there's Nisemonogatari, there's Bake Monogatari, there's Owari Monogatari, but like Katana is different, even though same person, right? They released Steins Gate, which is still considered to this day to be one of the best sci fi Number three, bro. stories. Nowadays, they're mainly known for their work on Re Zero, yep. which has some really great animated sequences, particularly in episode 18. This is a weird episode because Rem. it's literally just two people talking, but White Fox did such a good job making this episode. One of the best. Special shout out to episode director Kazumo Koga for elevating this scene from just two people talking into Let's go, a super Glaze. climax. Now, they're an incredibly small studio at only 46 employees, which probably does mean that they outsource okay. a lot of their work, but it is still impressive that they managed to create such big IPs with such a small team. And in 2018, they ended up founding a new studio with the help of Egg Firm, which. That's crazy! Studio Bind, which is specifically made for Mushoku Tensei, came from White Fox that worked on ReZero. I'll get to later. David Production was founded by four. This is like the studio known for JoJo's, right? Um, Captain Tsubasa, the remake, I think, uh, is 
one of their newest projects by David Productions, I think. Former Gonzo producers Koji Kajita and Taito Kira. They also got a ton of Studio Shaft veterans to join their studio. And you can Shaft. see the work shine on Fire Force and JoJo's. They are a comparatively smaller studio, and their name is literally a reference to David and Goliath. The studio itself is well known for being super creative in its art palettes and ideas. And this has greatly helped influence their ultra popular Yeah, it always looks to me that JoJo characters are always switching colors. Hair colors. Outfit colors, but like the color palette just changes, right? It's like an acid trip. Adaptation of the Jojo Bizarre Adventure manga franchise. I'm sure you've seen and heard all the Jojo memes that have come out of the anime series. In an interview yes. with the co-director of almost every part of Jojo's, now Katsu Suda, he actually explains that the meme ability of the series was intentional. The Jojo graphic novels over the years have become something of an internet meme. Or yeah, meme culture, you know, it's one of the best ways to do marketing. A lot of people talk more about how the ridiculous of the show is, so yeah, it's smart. At least they are the source of a lot of internet. What the fuck is happening here, though? What the hell? That means one thing we can do today that would have been possible. Hey, kids, go away. Stop gawking at us as a dude is gawking you down there right now. 20 years ago is pick up what on the, the established fuck? and see how we can pull those into the anime. Stop thrusting! Fact, was fully intended. We wanted to make a show where a fan could watch the animated episode and then go back to the graphical novel and see their idea of JoJo was faithfully animated. I'm what the fuck is JoJo's, bro? What is happening here? It's a bunch of kids watching and this dude can't get his... Face off this guy's ass! Honestly, such goat behavior. <laughs> now he's giving back shots? What is this show about? This is easily their biggest work and a great reminder of the creativity and passion that the studio has. If you want recommendations of other good shows they've done, Cells at Work and Undead Unluck are really fun. Oh, unfortunate for Undead Unluck, right? Because I think I got canceled or something. Cells at Work, I think, went pretty viral I, all i remember is the the little lollies right these lolly characters you know what's also fun the subscribe button hey look it's glowing for pride month studio dean was founded in 1975 by okay. former sunrise producer hiroshi hasegawa along with dean other sunrise sunrise. animators back in the day studio dean had a really good reputation and was making some of the most iconic anime rama one they oh they did rama originally they also did um Fate Stay Night, right? I think that's the original Fate Stay Night series that you guys were saying, you know, this is like chronologically like this happened, but you should, you know, just watch Unlimited Blade Works instead, buy you Fotable. Ah, Fruits Basket and Higurashi are still talked about to this day. But nowadays, Studio Dean has a pretty bad reputation. And that Why? is mostly due to their poor handling of the Seven Deadly Sins season. Uh, oh, they did. Oh, they're the ones that did this shit. Okay, I won't forget this. Why is Konosuba there? You tell me... Konosuba Studio Dean's like magnum opus. Three. This season is infamous for having some of the most piss poor animation ever. I'm not even a Seven Deadly Sins fan, and I still feel disappointed just looking at this. The it somehow is better than some Tower of God fights. <laughs> to say but like it's, it was moving most hype up fight was completely botched and since the first two <laughs> seasons had pretty good animation by a1 pictures dude it's not even the same but yeah a1 pictures polish versus studio dean at its worst i guess it kind of felt like it was all dean's fault that this shit just looked like ass but was this really the case i don't well, know is it apparently aniplex a1's parent company was ordered to make a season three pretty soon after the movie came out by netflix which had just flopped since a1 pictures was making way more money with sao and yep. fake grand order they didn't feel the need to make another season so aniplex asked studio they dropped to it on the project and i'm assuming this resulted in a rushed schedule unfortunately that just seems to be the norm with a lot of anime nowadays sao and fgo is the reason not fgo but fate is the reason why seven deadly sins failed no that's not right it's not their fault but in the interest of our corporate overlords their best interest is to maximize profits on already good shows they're gonna invest in the verticals that they're good at seven deadly sins is like eh. i mean we still got it around i guess and they gave it to the studio dean and then studio dean also was rushed and didn't have much resources to work with i guess and then they this is what you get this this is what you get Studios just bite off more than they can actually chew. If you watch Dean's other work, like Konosuba, you'll see that they can still make shows yeah, with great animation looks good. Cuts, but it's definitely a mixed bag. JC Staff was founded in 1986. JC Staff right now, I have a pretty good, uh, like, I like them. Why? Well, we're recently watching Railgun, obviously, right? Railgun is hopping off. 
There's also Danmachi, which is their like one of their most prized series too, along with I think Railgun. And even other random weeklies like Mao 2099, which is airing currently in what is this? Uh we're not in winter. We're in fall 2024. It's pretty good. This the 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 um the po the quality and the polish is there, but one punch man season two also happened, you know? And I remember that just having just the shittiest reputation ever. Obviously, compared to season one, it's impossible to compare those two, but like JC stuff I think is alright. They're pretty decent. By Tomoyuki Miyata, and they've unfortunately been branded as a sort of budget anime studio just like Dean. The main wah, reason wah. for this was the release of One Punch Man Season 2. Now, yeah, there don't it get is. Don't me wrong, I still enjoyed Season 2's story. I even think it has some good scenes in general. But director Shingo Natsume's ability to attract industry veterans like Yutaka Nakamura was what made Season 1 so good. Yes, and that sentiment right there is something that I was very ignorant of. I've been reading some comments recently, you know, when we were recovering some, uh, like, We've been doing a lot of like blue lock drama news and stuff like that and thinking about how talents are procured and it seems like quite a lot of these animators, the best ones, are freelance workers. And in this industry, right, there was the example made of why would so many people go work for MAPPA and JJK? It's because of the people working there. The talent attracts other talent. They're all friends. It's an inside circle. People want to help out their friends who are, you know, like considered rivals or, you know, people to aspire for, right? So the elites are all kind of like flocking together and they have that pull of different talents coming in. Yeah, basically S rank mercenary. <laughs> yeah, pretty much think of it like that, right? This whole anime, you know, animation freelance work is just like a guild. It's like an adventurous guild and, you know, you, <laughs> you got motherfuckers saying, all right, we, we're pulling out for this party, who wants to join? And only the top rank, you know, animators are recruited. And when you have to follow up one of the best animators and just an all-around insane team of animation veterans, it is easy to fall short, but also to be a bit of an asshole. It's not a secret that a lot of JC staff anime just have pretty bad animation quality in general. In fact, I would say One Punch Man Season 2 and Food Wars are probably some of their best works. And okay. although Psyche K is funny as hell, let's be honest, the animation, this is actually the definition of mid. I mean, probably even <laughs> below mid. The show was great, but it's... Which is sad because like this looks good compared to the mid that I'm seeing now. My standard is getting lower and lower because of projects like Failure Frame, Blue Lock, Tower of God, all these shows like Newgate. What are some ridiculous like Re Monster was also pretty dookie, man. There's a lot of these shows where it's just just so so mid and poor and just min maxed it's definitely not because of the animation way of the house husband another example it's literally just colored manga panels yeah and maybe hey that's some blue lock shit you have a colored manga panel with like impact lines right look at this shit look at, look at these speed lines literally just colored manga panels and maybe for some people it looks good and it's fun to watch but for me there's just there's not enough motion and i'm not saying that this is the fault of people who work there you know tons of them are probably talented but clearly there's a reason that jc is taking so many shortcuts and it's probably because mm. and i have noticed a pattern of behavior of them taking so many projects like there obviously a lot of studios tries to maximize the amount of work they can do with the limited staff but like jc staff just works on so many shit at the same time they keep making like three shows in a single season obviously not all of them can look good when their time and money split up among so many different projects <laughs> like in summer 2023 just last year they released five shows oh shit they did yo reign of seven spellblades with jc staff it looked pretty decent the story <laughs> one of my favorite comments about this show is that I was so hyped for the vengeance plot, the whole, you know, the, the, the plot twist with the teachers and the main character. But what I got instead was gender studies and, you know, like how to water plants. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what people say. And I don't, I don't disagree, bro. That's, that's exactly what the fuck happened in season one. You teased them with the best shit and the rest of it was just the most pointless, boring stalling. It's like, oh my God. God, and people dropped it so Shows quick. Shows in the same season. That's insane. Again, I don't want to stereotype all of JC staff as being bad because it does depend on the people who are working on the project itself. It's not like they've never made amazing shows. Some of their best include... Yeah, some of their best. Again, Danmachi? Railgun, bro? The quality is there. Includes like Revolutionary Girl, Utena, Azuma Godayo, Karekano, which they made with Gainax, which I talked about in my previous anime studio video. And then later in the 2000s, they were some of the first to start adapting Karekano. 
Bro's not even mentioning Damachi and Railgun and look at all these other projects that's already so good apparently. Kawa light novels like Familiar of Zero and Railgun, both of which are really There great, it is. Let's be honest, overall shows a cover of Index rather than Railgun. I know he means the same. JC Stav does have a pretty bad stereotype and you know, the, the glove seems to fit. Studio Man Glove. Whatever you say about JC Stav, I think that they're top tier. Not peak like Dogakobo or Ufotable, right? But like, I've seen their great works. And like Danmachi right now, it's so good. Railgun, amazing. Like, when they want to try, they have obviously preferences and priority for their most prized products. And those shows are really good. And the ones that don't even get that much attention, like Mao 2099 right now, they're minimum like 7 out of 10 at best. And it's still so good. It, it, it's, maybe the competition is so bad that it's making you know, it look good. But it, like, their mid products are like a 7 out of 10, which is honestly pretty fucking decent. Globe was founded in 2002 by former Sunrise producers Shinichiro Dang, Kobayashi and Takashi Kochiyama. They started off with a bang, releasing Samurai Champloo in 2004 oh, as that's their a legendary first one. ever anime. Now, let me ask y'all a question. What happens when you mix the amazing director of Cowboy Bebop, Shinichiro Watanabe, and the literal godfather of lo-fi hip-hop and yep. musical icon Nujabes to make- You get a cultural fucking revolution. Like, Nujabes is such an important, you know, um person of their time with the music the lo-fi stuff bro rest in peace and cowboy bebop right like people love this shit they can animate well you get fucking perfection okay samurai shampoo samurai shampoo go grab yourself a i haven't seen it i haven't seen samurai shampoo or uh cowboy bebop why because I'm a stupid monkey that only watches Battle Shonen growing up and all these animes were discarded. Be a, a magic brownie and sit your ass on the couch, okay? It is Nirvana. Manglobe is known for the amount of creative freedom that they gave their directors. Samurai Shampoo, Ergo Proxy, these are great examples of what was accomplished with- Oh, I have heard from a lot of like pseudo intellects that this anime is um really, really good. Ergo Proxy, another show where it gets glazed a lot by the old heads, I think. With this freedom, they've also adapted a few manga series like Dead Man Wonderland and The World Only God Knows. <laughs> That's the heart of the show! The world- Yo, this shit almost got voted in. I, it, did it make it to a poll? It, it might have, but I, I remember you guys mentioning this one. Which is easily the best harem anime of all time. But unfortunately, this studio didn't last forever. They accumulated an insane amount of debt, oh. totaling up to 350 million yen, which accounting for inflation today is around $3 million. Jesus! They broke the company and they ended up declaring bankruptcy in 2015. I wish okay. I knew exactly why this happened, but there is a surprising lack of information on the topic. Uh, money laundering, embezzling by greedy corporate suits, mismanagement of money that goes to 3 million is insane. And around this studio in general, my best guess is that the 2008 global recession severely oh, maybe that. impacted them. And the fact that sure. Samurai Champloo was one of their biggest works, but still didn't do great for DVD sales, probably hurt them in the long run. I mean, just looking at this list of most of DVD sales, they're, they're not that great. Hmm. Also, I hope you're finally happy, dude. Doga Kobo was founded by former... There we go, bro. Doga Kobo is a studio that I've been glazing so much because of Oshinoko, because of Roche Dere. Now, they have sold their company to Katakawa. Katakawa now owns Doga Kobo. And now with the whole Sony, you know, acquiring Katakawa, I don't really know what that means for Doga Kobo, but hey, great anime so far. Toei employees Hideo Furusawa and Megumu Shiguro in 1973. Most of their earlier works were more on the Moe side of anime with shows like okay. Umaru chan and New Game, which- Wait, they did Umaru? This little hamster furball anime? You know, one of these is definitely good anime. The other one, uh... But nowadays, Doga Kobo is definitely more known for Oshinoko. their recent series, like Oshinoko. Yes. They're really showing the talent that they have. And you might be surprised to learn that the first season of Oshinoko was actually made on a pretty tight schedule. It really is a testament to the team, and especially series director Daisuke Hiramaki to invest Bald! But thank you so much, Daisuke Hiramaki. You created art. Eventually adapt the entire first volume into a single 90-minute episode instead of splitting it up into multiple 20-minute episodes. This guy is the reason why the first episode was movie length. Yeah, I think that if it was split up, it wouldn't have hit hard. 
Most people might have even dropped Oshinoko before it got to the most shocking part of, you know, the prologue. So I think the first volume being adapted like that, all through like a movie length episode, just genius. Episodes. I think my favorite moment from the show has to come from Kenji Sawada though, who did this brilliant scene where Ruby finally decides that she can dance too. And it's not surprising because he's also worked on the key animation for big shows like Free Rand and Spy Family. Another oh, star shit. player is Kana Hirayama, who's been at Doga Kobo for a while and whose intricate supervision of over 1,000 cuts alone as the chief animation director for the first episode made sure that she turned I into this captivating star for us to watch. And again, Yep, this is it, bro. These specific individuals, I'm starting to realize more and more that these freelance workers, these specific individuals, the top tier talent that exists is the reason Doga Kobo is good. It's not that Doga Kobo is good per se, but rather the talent that decided to stay with Doga Kobo that made it so fucking good, you know? Not surprising, considering she's contributed heavily to shows like Bochi the Rock and Tokyo Cool. Bochi the Rock to too. For great work at Doga Kobo, then check out Selection Project. But in general, I would also recommend a lot of their older works like Nozaki Kun, Plastic Memories, and GJ Club. Oh, Plastic Memories! Y'all been mentioning that, trying to make me cry all the time, bro. Seems like another tearjerker. Nope, I'm skipping. If you want something that just came out and is also really good, Jellyfish Can't Swim is really, really good. Oh yeah. Uh, copyright issues, right? I think a lot of people are comparing this to Butch the Rock due to the similarity of girls, you know, starting a band and stuff like that. But for the amount of episodes that we watched before the copyright strikes, pretty good anime. And I'm super excited for the new Oshinoko season as well. Studio OLM, formerly known as Oriental Light and Magic, was founded in 1990 by 10 previous Studio Gallup and OB planning employees. Just okay. like larger anime studios, OLM has many different departments that work on a ton of different shows. The most popular of which is easily the Pokemon anime series. And this is a- Wow, this is it. This is many people's childhoods right here, bro. Pokemon. A difficult task because you have to consistently adapt and change your art style to match the setting to setting changes and keep up with with the modern technology that animation is having. You can see this change most prominently from the yeah. Pokemon season X and Y to Sun and Moon, where the art style just dramatically changed. Does that and why? Because this model appeases the younger generation of kids actually buying and consuming Pokemon content? She caused a lot of backlash online for viewers because they were used to seeing Ash in a certain way. But this more simple character design- Bunch of fucking 40 year old men, bro. Bunch of dudes in their 30s and 40s getting upset that Ash doesn't look like what they used to remember 20 years ago. <laughs> um, but there must be a reason, right? If the old model simply would get more viewership, they would stick with it. I'm sure it's very intentional that they're trying to make the character models appeal to this new generation of audiences. Sign freed up the animation team to make even better looking action sequences. And even though they're most well known for Pokemon, they've made a ton of other anime, including like Beyblade, Komi-san, and Berserk. Yeah. Yo, Beyblade Burst! OLM, okay. I mean, on the second channel, we're literally about to start watching Beyblade Burst. Komi-san too, huh? Amber, like, what a random fucking lineup. Children's cartoon Beyblade. We got rom-com slice of life anime, Japanese shit, right? And then we got Berserk, just dark fantasy. Yes, literally just a few months after oh, they made fuck? the first season of Pokemon, OLM animated the 1997 adaptation of Berserk. This is still regarded by a lot of manga fans to be the best- Like, what? Y'all were working on Pokemon, Pokemon, Pokemon. That's like, you know what? After all the things that we've created, all these wholesome children's cartoons, fuck it, let's go to the other side of the pool. <laughs> Berserk time, yo. Best adaptation of the work, but if you don't mind CG, the Golden Age movies aren't the worst either. OLM is such a huge studio at this point that they have a ton of different internal teams and multiple different subsidiary companies in other countries to outsource their work to. In fact, they're so big that I was actually able to find their company profile on Glass. Ooh, 2.8 out of 5. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the reviews are probably making it sound like it's a black company. Door, a website where people can rate companies and how good they are to work for. So let's read some of these together. Good <laughs> colleagues and seniors, chill environment. Okay, okay, that's pretty cool. Overworked employees, poor work-life balance. Yep, sounds like, I mean, this isn't unique to OLM though, right? I think this is just every fucking anime company. It's Next one is uh, as bad as MAPPA, terrible working conditions, non-ethical hours, terrible HR, low pay, disrespectful yeah. employers, and those Sounds are just about... the pros. Wait, no, that's the pro. <laughs> that's the 
froze. What's the cons? Oh, surely one of them has got to be good. Let's see. Deadline base. So you have absolutely no choice but to finish work, even if it takes the whole night. No overtime pay, even though working past 9 p.m. almost every mm. day. Worst overtime was until two days. Two days? What? So, like, what about the next day? Rather than getting paid for a new day, because you're still on overtime, you're still not getting paid? More than 24 hours and no extra pay whatsoever. And overtime past 2 a.m. happens every month. Toxic managers, guilt tripping staff when you're unable to finish work or wanting to extend time. Feel yeah. Your 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. is very rare. Look at that. Do you, have, do you, have, do you, real, do you re realize how ridiculous that statement means? Like... They're yearning for the 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's already a nine hour work week, by the way. Sorry, nine hour work day. They're saying nine to six is rare. We gotta go beyond nine to six. The base, the standard, what they're yearning for is already fucked up. I feel so bad. Japanese, you know, work culture, it's so abusive. It's so inhumane. They're trying to just squeeze just blood out of a rock. At the cost of all these people barely just, you know, surviving and ugh, just, you know, that's a, that's a, I could go on a rant about this shit. You know how I feel about that, but typical black company shit. Feels inhumane. Your 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. is very rare. Feels like it's impossible. Well, that's, that's kind of just depressing. Okay. Yeah. Cloverworks used to be a separate studio within A1 Pictures, but okay. they've since rebranded to their own studio in 2018. Clo yeah. And, uh, both these companies, like. Their product, fucking lit. A1 Pictures, I glaze because they're just that good. They're honestly so, so good. We came off of a marathon of, you know, SAO. Season 3, Season 4 was crazy good. And then we had, you know, Maki and Heroin recently as like a seasonal anime rom-com we watched. The quality is superb. Cloverworks, too. We watched Elusive Samurai for a bit. Like, what I've seen from them that, it's just quality work. What works is known for their character expressiveness and creative visuals in shows like Bochi the Rock, Spy Family, and Windbreaker, which just came out this spring season and has some of the best fight sequences I've ever seen. Most of their works are romances and slice of life shows with a heavy emphasis on comedy. Oh, they did My Dress Up Darling, okay. Comedy. However, as with many amazing studios, from what I've heard, they have a pretty bad scheduling problem. <laughs> in 2021, while Cloverworks was getting a team ready for their 2022 lineup of anime, Chief Animation Director Kimonori Ito started posting Twitter complaints about the schedule, even going as far as to say, it's too painful, death. This is I remember the tweets coming out during JJK Shibu incident, bro. The, the actual incident was what was happening at, you know, corporate HQ for MAPPA, man. It is crazy. He, he literally tweeted, death. It's too painful. Death. And, you know, again, this is not unique to a company in Japan. It feels like every fucking company in Japan is like this. Not every one of them, but like majority sounds really... The corporate structure only, you know, results in shit like this. Someone who has worked on some of the biggest shows in the past, like Chainsaw Man and Gintama. And at Cloverworks, he worked on Tokyo 24th Ward and Horimiya. Unfortunately, this kind of insane production schedule affects everyone in the anime studio, even as someone as talented and high up as Ito. Cloverworks is also very well known for their massive fumbling of Promise Neverland Season mm. 2. Now, I'm going to get a little speculative here and say that the reason that Promise Neverland Season 2 was... Um, I heard amazing things about Season 1. I think season two failed because didn't they do like an anime original thing that pissed a lot of people off? I, I think that's the talking points I was hearing when this shit was airing and had drama. So rushed and completely ruined the manga ending was because they were just too booked as a studio to keep making new seasons or because they had an insanely tight production schedule that just... They just skipped to the end, huh? Interesting. Okay didn't allow for more continued seasons, but that's just a theory. A game the 8-bit was founded in 2008 by- <laughs> <laughs> Ew. Ew, brother, ew. Ew, what is that? Ew. <sighs> Please, free my people. Let my people go, 8-bit studio. Let Blue Lock and Tensura. <laughs> Let them go, please. Why are you doing this? And the most fucked up thing is, Blue Lock is actually hype right now. 
It is. Despite the eight frames that we get. That's right. Eight frames, dude. This, despite the lack of animation we get, the story is carrying. So a lot of people are still hyped for Blue Lock, but <sighs> come on, man. Former satellite members and is now a subsidiary of Bandai Namco Filmworks, formerly known as Sunrise. That used to be known for working on all those old school battle harem shows like Infinite Stratos, which was their first work. If you were a horny middle school teenager in 2013, like, Ain't this just the shit that you guys always voted? It is! I was, and you probably watched a lot of their shows. Nowadays, they are pretty much exclusively known for their work on That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime yeah. and Blue Lock, which both have become super popular in their own right. 8-Bit is pretty well known to have decent animation sometimes, but usually is not the most consistent. When they spend the budget to make their big scenes hit, the show often looks they can great, do it. amazing at times. They also love using CGI because it is one of the studio's specialties, and this can be a good cost-saving measure if used properly, but it can also be very jarring for a lot of viewers. But yep. discarding the CG moments, there's still a lot of times, especially in Blue Lock, where characters will just be talking and things kind of look like off. And while yeah, at least he's actually moving here, but we don't even get that anymore in the season two. It just Isagi just still framed with a bunch of lines happening as he just yaps for like fucking thirty seconds. While the first few episodes started off super strong, towards the end of the show, things really started looking worse and worse, with some of these proportions and shots just looking really weird. And as we've seen time and time again, this is probably an issue related to these scheduling. Scheduling. Of the That's it's hard right. To emphasize just how important time, money, and talent all contribute to an exactly. Pick two, bro. You can't just like, do you want time and talent? Well, then shit. You know, like the money's gonna suffer. You want money and talent? Then maybe time. You want money and time? Maybe talent. Like, it's just like, we need to give him appropriate time, talent, money, everything. But they're trying to get away with so little. And it's just like, it's, it's so, so sad to see what's happening. An anime success. However, I've been watching Slime Season 4, and so far the animation quality has been pretty decent. Hopefully, yeah, it okay. gives the same amount of time for Blue Lock, and especially its U20 arc, to cook, because the manga they have to adapt is straight fire from here. Four months ago. Oh, Ari Kendo. And I'm sure, you know, he's made a video actually recently about stuff like that, maybe, but oh no, this is so sad. <laughs> This is so sad. He's so hyped for the U20 art guys. Surely they're saving the budget for U20 art guys. From here on out. PA Works was founded in 2000 by... I got no clue what PA Works does. ...ex production IG member Kenji Horikawa. Apparently when he first started the studio, he was broke. So he borrowed an abandoned hospital building and turned it into a studio, which... That's what? They were especially popular in the 2010s. Bro borrowed an abandoned hospital and made it his studio? Shows like Angel Beats, Charlotte, and another. Legend Oh, okay. So these are some top, top hits. Charlotte, we've seen. Angel Beach, you guys talk about a lot. Trying to make me fucking cry. These are some huge shows. Legendary composer and writer Jun Maeda also worked on a ton of... Fuck you, Jun Maeda. You make some goddamn riveting story stories, but like, you make me cry. Why did you do that to Pooh? Why? Why did you do that to me and Pooh? Fuck you! PA works projects, making music, and even screenwriting for Angel Beats and Charlotte. They see didn't know that he was like a talented musician as well. Team 2 always deliver with consistent and great animation and even to this day they're continuing to make great shows like Skip and Loafer or Akiba Made War. They have a very oh, distinct shit. visual style that really emphasizes their amazing background art and personally I love it. They've also made some really insightful anime too like Shiro Bako which is literally about how anime is made which if you're watching okay. this might interest you. Ironically though PA Works has had some PR problems related to employee dissatisfaction. That's every studio, bro. Come on, right? It's like every studio does this shit. But it's a little complicated, so I'm going to simplify it a bit. Traditionally, animation is first storyboarded, and then someone creates the keyframes of that animation. Yep. Then in-betweeners will go in to fill the motion between keyframes, creating the smooth sequence that we see as an animation. Since most animators only get paid per drawing and not per hour, this can lead to some less than ideal pay. And yeah, we want to just maximize the amount of scenes rather than you know you're not getting billed by the time maximize the scenes an in-betweener for pa works posted on twitter that they were getting paid a really poor wage but it's not so much the case that pa works pays poorly in fact they actually pay above the average compared to most animation studios <laughs> yeah 
yeah, again, these are not studio specific problems. It's an industry problem. It's more of a problem that the industry as a whole is pretty broken and yep. kind of screws over in betweeners. These guys are basically the unsung heroes of the anime industry because on average, they earn around 200 yen per drawing, which Yikes. is less than $2. Sometimes these drawings can take up to an hour, but you still get paid the same amount per drawing. PA Works is better than the industry standard at around 220 yen per drawing. That still kind of sucks. Rather than $2, you get $2.20, guys. But it's important to understand that this isn't usually the fault of the animation studio itself. Here is a graph showing the annual profits of the anime industry. These small yellow bars represent the portion that the anime studio is... And this is what I'm fucking talking about. The amount of money that these corporations are racking in, it is so disproportionate to the amount of money that actually goes to the people making the anime. Because at the end of the day, the sponsors, the people that's backing these companies, right? The production committees, all the important decision makers who are in these corporate suits. They're the ones that pads their wallets and they leave these studios dry. And that's why you have motherfuckers getting paid, what, $32 USD a month on that Blue Lock project? Remember Martin, you know, saying that on the 8-Bit Studios, you know, interview stuff? Like, crazy shit, man. Look how unfair it is. Look how insanely broken and unfair it is. The rich truly do get richer and the poor continues to get poorer. And nothing will be done unless people fucking take a stance to encourage better working rights, right? Create unions, protect the workers. But in a, company, in a culture like Japan, Asia specifically, right? In this mindset of always, you know, just put your head down and don't stand out. Listen and be a good boy, right? be courteous to your elders this kind of like culture does really promote this corporate culture where it's so easy to be just told what to do and you can't talk back and with that kind of mindset it's really hard to break out of this kind of like system actually receive because these production committees are the ones funding anime and they hold the ip anime studios don't see any of the money the production committees do and this leads to the lack of funds for a lot of animators especially ones that are just starting out and are in betweeners but anyway that's a whole nother discussion my personal favorite pa works anime has to be their movie makia it is genuinely one of the most underrated anime films of all time like i'm gonna be real i don't usually cry when watching anime or movies or anime movies but for some reason when i watch makia Mach the yeah. Waterworks, that shit went crazy. If you enjoy okay. Tearjerkers, 100% check that out. Production IG was... Which means I will 100% skip. Fuck Tearjerkers, I'm not here to cry. Stop it. I'm sure it's a great show. I just don't want to cry. 200 in 1987 by Mitsuchisa Ishikawa and Takayuki Goto. IG has made some of the biggest and most influential anime of all time. And I think these amazing works are partly due to their found league ideals. Co-founder Ishikawa said in an interview that when I started IG in 1987, anime was thought as an extension of manga. Anime had no importance of its own. I wanted to make an anime feature film that stood on its own without manga. And if mm. we're talking about IG, we have... Anime only. No more manga inspiration. We want to create our own original stories. Let's talk about Mabur Oshi, one of the best anime directors of our time. With his breakout movie, Pat Labor, he immediately solidified himself as a big name in the industry. I don't want to say who, but like, goddamn, these are so beyond our times. I have no clue, but a legend in the scene. Tree, and then he directed Ghost in the Shell, which literally helped oh, shape the genre the of shell. cyberpunk, serving as a core inspiration to dystopian movies like The Matrix. This movie was a global phenomenon and helped. Ghost in the Shell influenced some prominent filmmakers. The Wachowski is creators of The Matrix. And she, wow, really? The Matrix was inspired by Ghost in the Shell? That's crazy. Bring anime in general to the West. Not only that, in the last few years, IG has produced Haikyuu and single-handedly changed Japanese men's volleyball. As Look at that, bro. And a similar thing happened, I think, with basketball too, with Kuroko no Basket or like a Slam Dunk. But look at that, bro. Volleyball was like a downfall. Dying, dying, and then volleyball propaganda happened. <laughs> and then boom, it's the most popular shit. There's tons of people. I don't think it's the most popular shit. Baseball is probably the, still the most biggest sport in Japan, right? We're now more interested in the sport. IG also owns Wit Studio as a subsidiary, which has oh. produced popular shows like Attack on Titan and Vinland Saga. They own Wit. One. And recently, IG has taken on a more interesting role in the anime industry. Instead of subcontracting like most other studios, they started being a prime contractor. Yo, Heavenly Delusion, Awashi. 
Noblesse, that's that webtoon shit. Kaiju, eh? We know about this. In financing other anime production. Sodi Piero was founded in 1972 Naruto. by Yuji Nunokawa, and they are responsible for some of the biggest anime ever released. Their cataloging. Wait, Naruto and Bleach? Includes shows like Naruto, Bleach, Black Clover. Holy, imagine they got their hands on One Piece. That's crazy. You have two of three of the big three and you have Black Clover, which is also huge on its own. Like, that's crazy. All of which are shown in mega hits in their own right. Their first ever project was an adaptation of The Wonderful Adventures of Nils, which is a... <laughs> what the fuck is this? Swedish novel. Interesting. But I would say their breakout hit was Urusei Yatsura, directed by Mamoru Oshii. Ah, we have a remake of this airing recently, right? So this is, you know, where it came from. Of which they did the first hundred or so episodes. This anime was a pioneer in the romantic comedy genre, and then they released Yu Yu Hakusho a decade later, which to this day- Yo, I, I don't think Yu Yu Hakusho gets enough, like, recognition, right? The whole spirit gun shit. Haven't seen it myself, but I heard that, you know, the authors, it's the same person that did, did Hunter Hunter, right? And I think this gets kind of like overshadowed by other shows like Naruto, Bleach, and One Piece. He has one of the best torment arcs of all time. Yu Hakusho was directed by Noriyuki Abe, who is on an insane amount of projects at Perio. He also helped direct Tokyo Mew Mew, Great Teacher Onizuka. Tokyo Mew Mew? <laughs> okay, GTO I have heard of him. And Bleach. There it is. Bleach is fucking huge. Because Piero is such a big studio, they have a ton of different teams. But if I'm going to shout out someone, I definitely want to shout out Hiroki Yamashita for doing such amazing work on both Naruto and Bleach Thousand okay. Year Blood War. Specifically, episode 6, where he was involved in storyboarding, direction, and animation. And okay, this, this guy is the real deal, huh? This is one of those elite S-Frank mercenaries I'm talking about. This shit looks amazing. Thankfully, it also looks like Studio Piero is trying to improve their employee well-being and working conditions in the industry. The what? managing director of Piero Kiero, Kiero Itsumi said that humans, not computers, create anime. So if these humans become exhausted, there's nothing we can do. Such a way of creating things is not sustainable, sustainable. in the long run. That's crazy. Wow. The hell? This is rare. This is, this, this is how it, the normal should be. This should be the norm. But like, because of how many companies just, you know, work their animators like fucking slaves in the Prince of Egypt, man. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Instead of being paid uh, 200 yen or 220 yen, uh, they're going to be paid 240 yen instead. That's why since I joined Piero, we've made significant revisions to salaries and even retroactively increased overtime pay by 20%. Wow, I believe we've dedicated hey, that's a percentage, man. To improving working conditions. This is a great sign in the anime industry and I hope more studios follow in their footsteps. Will they though? Will they though? I don't know. Studio Bind was founded in 2018 as a go. joint venture by Egg Firm and White Fox. The studio was originally just made for Mushoku Tensei. And that's one of the coolest things where a studio specifically made for one anime. I think that can only just be good for that specific anime. It just goes to show like how popular that series is and how loyal and dedicated the staff are into making that anime. But recently they've made another show, Onimai, and are coming out with new. So they've made Mushoku Tensei, then they made Onimai. I see. Fun fact, I watched about half of Onimai uh, when this was airing as a seasonal anime. And I was recording myself, and there was a part when I was about halfway into the anime episode, the first episode, and I was like, I can't upload this. I, I can't. I was like... And this is coming from a guy that completed gushing over magical girls. I, I just like, I can't do this. And I, and, I, and I turned off the recording and I moved on to something else. New shows in 2025. Apparently, Mushoku Tensei was greenlit all the way back in 2016, but because it had such a long pre-production process, probably because of the insane quality, it took a while for it to release. In fact, the quality of season one was so good that people mm. are starting to question the currently airing season of Mushoku Tensei. As a Why is this so much worse? Was season two that bad compared to season one? I'd have to go back and compare everything, but I guess if you're compar comparing like 99 versus like, let's say like 90, it's going to be relatively worse. But season two, was it so bad that I'd be making complaints? I can't really tell. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and really just dissect every scene.
a lot of its core staff has since left the production. A lot of people are saying that it just doesn't look as good. However, mm. I still think that Mushoku Tensei Season 2 has some great cuts, and that is of course due to the wonderful work of Kyukawa. Although he was simply a key animator in the first season, he definitely had his hand in making some of the best moments in the show. With episode 22, he has just flexed his skills as an episode director for the first time. Father's Day episode. Christ, what an amazing directorial debut. I mean, this episode had some of the best action sequences I've ever seen, and the VFX that the team chose to use was really incredible. Kyukawa is a newer face in the industry, but just like Studio Bind, I have Taiwan! Taipei City, Taiwan! Let's go! We got a Taiwanese, uh... Animator? 25 years old. Young genius. I have high hopes for their future projects. Silverlink was founded in 2007 by Hayato Kaneko. Nowadays, most anime from them involve Aonuma as a director or co-director. Okay. They're well known for making slice of life shows like Nonon Biori and some of the Fate series spin-offs, or at least- Oh, I heard the Prisma shit is actually really hype, man. At least I think that's what this is. I'm gonna be honest, I know nothing about Fate and I'm definitely not learning for this video. They've made a ton of anime that are some of my personal favorites. I have fond memories of watching Baka and Test, Wadamode, and Kokoro Connect, which is still one of my favorite anime. Just the shitload of slice of life, huh? I made to this day. I mean, I fucking love Kokoro Connect, which is what makes this next part. So Wait, this dude did Misfit of Demon King Academy and Our Last Crusade? Silverlink did that? No. Oh. Well, now my. <sighs> Those are really mismanaged, huh? Those are really, really poorly managed, huh? So sad. A big controversy at Silverlink was the fact that voice actor Mitsuhiro Ichiki was apparently tricked into auditioning for a role in the anime Kokoro Connect. This audition was set up by producer of the show, tricked? and apparently the entire point of it was to make Ichiki say sus things that could be remixed into something weird out of context. <laughs> Man, this guy... Imagine what he's gonna do with AI coming in. And this is like before AI, a voice acting where you could take, you know, recordings of everyone and just come up with your own ridiculous signs and make it seem like the person said it. This dude was doing it before that. He made him do a fake audition to say all these different lines and then wanted to use that for his own good. That <laughs> what a demon, bro. Ruthless businessman. Ichiki then had to sit through a PR event for the show where they played his out of context clips and what the fuck? You got made fun of after that? Okay. That warrants like a lawsuit. Are you serious? Like, I thought that this guy was doing shit behind the back, which is not good still. Terrible. But he publicly humiliated him after taking that shit? And revealed that he didn't even get the role because the role for this show never even existed. What the fuck? I don't know what kind fuck? of twisted psychopath comes up with a plan like this, but once the story got out there, there was understandably a ton of outrage. People started boycotting the anime and the Good. studio itself, and they eventually had to issue an official apology. It sucks because I really do love Kokoro Connect, especially since the show is literally about overcoming personal trauma with the help of your friends. Which is Nothing like, you know, a studio that makes an anime about overcoming trauma. But the fucking boss man is like giving trauma to their workers. Like, what are you doing? But makes the situation all the more <laughs> ironic. Silverlink also has the reputation of not having the greatest animation with shows like Death March really just being super boring and derivative. But they've also made good stuff like the aforementioned Kokoro Connect, Mitsuboshi Colors, and My Next Life as a Villainess. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. There's still a ton. Thank you, Mr. Akiken, Arikendo for the in-depth, you know, I should look up to this guy. Or the in-depth explanation of different studios. And some of them, for sure, I did understand, you know, what they were doing before. But it's cool to see, like, oh, this is, like, the studio behind these projects. Oh, remember these fucking failures? Yep. They're behind, you know, Seven Deadly Frames and stuff like that. Oh, you remember these studios? Oh, actually, they're the ghosts. There's a studio specifically made for Mushoku Tensei and stuff like that. Which is, you know, cool knowledge to know. So that I think that, like, before... And here's a link to the video. Please go check out his channel and share his content if you'd like. But... Before, I was going into seasonal anime just not even aware of what the studios are, right? I'm just looking at the title and just basing it off of it. But now that I'm kind of like understanding more and more about like what the studio's background is and what kind of content they make, I'm able to kind of like filter through like good ones, you know, and try to sift out the bad ones. For example, if I see A1 Picture making a seasonal anime, I know it's going to be good, right? Doga Kobo, I know it's going to be good. But some show is like, I don't know, like fucking Silverlink, for example, or... What's a show that's, you know, really sus? Like, Studio Dean is kind of sus too right now, right? 
they're kind of like, eh, I don't know, but that's it for me. See you next time.